You can, I'll, I started the recording, you can go ahead. Okay, this is verse 14. And if you are using this edition of Hatha Yoga Pradipika, then it's on page 47. Verse 14, in this manner, dwelling in the hermitage, being devoid of all thought, excess meditation, yoga should be practiced in the way instructed by the guru. Dwelling in the hermitage, being devoid of all thought, means that by living in a place of spiritual vibrations, the mind is free from unnecessary thoughts cultivated by society and the modern lifestyle. Under normal conditions, the mind can never be thoughtless. Swat Marama is actually saying that the mind should be devoid of all thoughts and all, I'm sorry, that the mind should be devoid of all thoughts that are irrelevant to spiritual life. Anxieties and worries caused by family and business should be absent during Sahana, as such disturbances affect one's ability to concentrate. It is a natural tendency of the mind to dwell on past events and to contemplate the future, but this tendency has to be controlled. The mind has to be concentrated on the practice at hand, and it must be kept in the present. There is a constant and habitual mental chatter which has to be nullified. And for this, the practice of antar mona is very useful. An undisciplined mind is like a boisterous child, telling stories, continually distracting you from your sadhana. If you are working in your study, you do not allow the children to come in and disturb you. The same applies when you are practicing sadhana. When the mind is assailed by unwanted and irrelevant thoughts, you should cultivate the habit of putting these thoughts aside until later, when you have finished your sadhana. It does not mean that those who have no control of mind are excluded from practicing. In fact, most people today suffer from infirmity of mind. Few people have real control of their mind. At man's present stage of evolution, the mind is weak. However, we have to start somewhere, so it is better not to concern yourself with mental activities. Just do your practices and let the mind do what it likes. If you do not try to constantly block and suppress the mind, it will automatically become obedient and concentrated. In the days of Yogi Swat Marama, people may have been more sattvic by nature. Nowadays, we find that people are rather tamasic or raj, rajasic. A sattvic person will have a quiet mind and his sadhana will progress unhindered by the chitta virtis or mental modifications. However, a rajasic person will have a very restless and oscillating mind, while a tamasic person will have a dull and lazy mind. Therefore, we have to make concessions. We should also remember that in Swat Marama's day, more people were able to devote their whole lives or a considerable portion of their lives to sadhana. It is not possible for people today to leave all their social commitments and simply practice sadhana all day. Few people could even manage to take a month off work to retreat into seclusion for intensive sadhana. This is highly recommended, but if impractical, further modifications have to be made. Let us say that for the average person, it is enough to have a room set aside and to devote 30 minutes to sadhana every day. Yoga should be practiced in the way instructed by the guru. This is probably the most important sentence in the whole text. Whichever yoga text you pick up, you will read the same thing. The Shiva Samhita says, having attained the guru, practice yoga. Without the guru, nothing can be auspicious. According to the Skanda Purana, the systematic stages of yoga can only be learned from a competent guru. The Yoga Bija says that he who wants to practice yoga should have a competent guru with him. In this Sruti, it is written that Mahatmas revealed those things only to him who has deep devotion towards his guru as well as God. Thus, guru is the most vital element in sadhana. Guru is not merely a yoga teacher. He is the only one who can enlighten your soul by the lum luminosity of his own revealed spirit. He reflects the brilliance of your spirit and what you see in him is actually your own self. 
Gu means darkness and Ru means light. Guru is the one who removes the darkness and ignorance from the mind to reveal the pure light of the inner consciousness. He may be an adept in yoga or any science, or he may be completely illiterate. His social qualifications are unimportant as far as your spiritual experience is concerned. The important factor is your faith in his words and your obedience. Then it does not matter whether his instructions seem right or wrong, they will prove fruitful to you. In the science of Hatha Yoga, there is a specific system which has to be followed. And if you find a Hatha Guru, he will instruct you in the correct manner in which you should practice. It does not mean that the same system should be followed by your neighbor. Your guru knows how to tackle all of the indiv individual problems you are having. If no obstacles arise, good, he can guide you more quickly. If you are facing certain problems or difficulties, he will know how to guide you step-by-step step in accordance with your own personal evolution. We have very little understanding of our bodily functions, and we are virtually unaware of our mental potential. Consciousness is like an iceberg. We can only see the superficial portion, which is above the surface. And because of our limited perceptions, we cannot understand how yoga can evolve the spirit from the gross body and the lower consciousness. Therefore, when we take to sadhana, it is essential for us to have the guidance of one who thoroughly understands the process of spiritual unfoldment. There is only one person for this purpose, that is the guru. Can, can I stop and ask a question about this? Yeah, and Amanda joined us too, so she's on the speakerphone. Okay. Um, the whole first part, um, and especially the part that says, look, your mind is going to jump around, there's going to be noise coming in right and left all over the place, just keep going. You know, don't punish yourself too much for the noise, just keep going and you keep practicing and you're going to find that you can do, you get better at it, you can, you can focus better and, and you can be quiet and mindful you know, for me, in longer periods of time and, and with less horrible effort. Um, and all of that to me makes sense. But this whole last piece about the guru, uh, I really, I have questions about. Does that mean you study only with one person? And I, I mean, you know, to me, it sounds almost magical. So First, I see study with one person, and that sort of reminds me of some other people who have written, look, be consistent about your study. If you're not consistent, if you hop all over the place, you're not going to know which approach helps you to get to where you want to be. But the second thing this seems to say is that there's an individual out there who is your spiritual guru who can help you get there faster. Is that what it's saying? Wait, hold on, Amanda. Let me. Try now. Let me let me see if I can find. Can you can you hear me, Sue? Yeah. She can. Okay, so in um in the tradition that I learned in, there are several different gurus. Do you have I honestly can't remember all the Sanskrit for them, but the first guru you have um is the one that introduces you to like your parts of the Starbucks. Hold up, sorry for any noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, Starbucks was once a guru for me. <laughs> guru. And then there's the one, like your guru who initiates you into a lineage. And then you have um, Big Chef Gurus, I think it's called, where they they also teach you the lineage, but they're not the ones who initiated you. Like, you'll find in your life that different people will pop up. Um, some people initiate with the teacher, which is what guru means, and then they stick with them for their whole lives. And there's sort of like a sweetness that develops through that relationship. And then there's always somebody that you can sort of, um, what's the word? You can, like, look up to them. You can ask questions to them. 
if they don't know, they can ask their guru, and it's Parampara, it's like an unbroken chain um, of a lineage that goes all the way back thousands of years, and there's a lot of benefit in that. Um, in yoga in the West now, uh, you know, it's like, we, I think we were talking about that yesterday, the sort of watering down of traditions. I don't know if I was talking to you guys yesterday or somebody else, but it's um, it's like you get some bad people stepping into that position, then everybody thinks that, like, any kind of guru is bad. But that's really not the case. Um, a guru can be very beneficial. It's like, if I want to learn math, sure, I can go into the book and I can teach myself math, but it's going to take me quite a bit longer than some going and adhering to an expert in math who can very quickly show me the equation. You know what I mean? So, like, the purpose of the guru is that there's this lineage that gives us a system that is very effective and will work quicker, like you were saying, Sue. Um, it'll bring you results quicker than if you were just sort of trying to figure it out on your own. But it doesn't mean that the only way to access enlightenment is through a guru. You're already enlightened, you just forgot. So if we can sort of like un... Like the only point of the guru is to help you deal with your mind and body. Your soul already has everything that it needs. Like your Atman already has everything that it needs. So we, we adhere to the guru to help us to sort of um, transcend the mind and body to get to what we truly are. But you can do that on your own as well. It's just going to take a lot longer. So that's, that's the idea of, um, at least in, in my tradition, um, of the guru's role. Just teachers. They're just teachers to show you the lineage, to show you the way. So what you said, at, at least in the in the West and in the in our lives today, what kind of resonated to me was that there will be different gurus along the way, um, and different people that are helpful in understanding. Sure, it's just like the idea is like, so say I'm gonna pop into like where where of the Himalayas like at Revolution majority of your teachers have learned through me and I've learned through the Himalayan um, yoga tradition, the Himalayan masters yoga tradition. Right. So that's the lineage we all learn from and that's the lineage we all teach from. So say you're going to dip into that honey pot for like 30 days and then you're going to decide to go to a Buddhist teacher for 30 days and then a Taoist teacher for 30 days and then like a Vaishnava teacher for 30 days. It's almost like you can't necessarily get into the depths of it because yeah. we're digging lots of shallow holes. So the idea is like once you find um, what your temperament is, what your constitution is, once you find a person that you trust, that you can learn from, that like you resonate with their mind, then you kind of like try to dig deeply into that lineage. I think that what I was saying about like the problem in the West is people are like um, making things up. They're like, I'm just going to like smush all these different things together and I'm going to make up this thing and I'm going to market it i'm gonna make money on it <laughs> and they don't really necessarily they're like teaching surface stuff and there's no way to get down to the bottom because nobody ever got down to the bottom with them okay i may answer your question does that make any sense it answers the question not only that it just sounds like learning anything else you you can't hop around you gotta right. find something that resonates and stick with it I keep working at it, and eventually you, you learn it at a level that is helpful to you, whatever you're looking for. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, and I guess with this book, I love that she's like, you know, this, this is how it should be done, but this is, we can't do it nowadays. And she gives us other ways. And so it's the same with the guru. I feel like in America, so many people have taken advantage of their role of guru. I've come across some people myself that I've awakened myself now that it's not just somebody puts themselves in that seat and I can trust them immediately because too many people have abused the role. So my role as a student is now not just trusting everything out of somebody that calls themselves a guru, but yeah. personally finding my guru by people that are living their life 
by what they're teaching versus people just preaching what they're teaching. Like if you want to learn math and you find a teacher that is really telling you like two plus two equals five and you're like, I don't know about that, but you stick with them. Like that's your decision. And like, that's how I'm like, I love studying under Amanda because the, what she teaches is how she lives her life. And it all resonates with stuff like my soul already feels. I just have to train my body and mind to get on the same page as it. Um, oh, that's very sweet, thank you. And it, it's not even just a man, it's the whole, that, what? That brings up like a lot of, a lot of things about how when you lose the tradition, you lose the rules. Like yeah. in, in my teachers always tell me, um, here are the criteria of how I should act. And if I stop acting acting this way towards you guys, then I am no longer qualified to be your guru. Mm -hmm. And like and students aren't educated in the West on what their guru should act like and what their behavior should be. And then they just sort of fall for anything because someone seems knowledgeable about a thing and they're suffering and they're promising they can relieve their suffering. Yeah. But that's like not, that's not tradition. That's just like cult worship, which is very dangerous. It's like manipulative. And there's so right. much manipulative in America, I feel like, because we're greed and we're know-it-alls. <laughs> <laughs> um, Right, it's all monetized. It's a big problem. It sort of like pollutes. It pollutes it. And I, so, I yeah. think, I think it goes back to my favorite sutra, Sue. Like you have to practice something every day for a long period of time, over and over, right? And once you start doing that yeah. with a teacher and with a guru, the first thirty days you don't get the real side of them. Like it's like when you start dating someone, it's that honeymoon period. Yeah. <laughs> and then after a few. You know, like, or something right yeah <laughs> and then you start and then they like invite you over their house and you're like this is how you live like this isn't this doesn't match with what you were saying and it's not like a judgmental thing it's just like I don't I want to be part of someone that I want to be studying under someone in that type of leadership role that isn't isn't living like uh, this whole idea for yoga for me was the idea of taking all the hats off and being the same person in every role I step into whether it's my job as a yoga teacher as a yoga student as a friend as a family member as an enemy like I I didn't want to have to keep changing hats and I feel like that's what the guru should be it should be a role taken very seriously and somebody that doesn't put the guru hat on, it becomes a different person. And if I can do it, then they should certainly be able to do it. You know, I, I also think that a part of this message, what you said is true, you know, how do people, does the life reflect the words? You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's important. But it's very, it's very interesting. I was thinking of two things. One is, it's very easy to go to a class that feels extraordinarily comfortable to you and that you link in on but the person is still not necessarily the right person for you because that comfort level could be based on being comfortable with something that's a part of you that you really should be moving forward from, you know, and that you might want to try to grow out of, but it's comfortable. So it's, it's like still being caught in the same circle. And then the second thing I was thinking of uh, was a, a friend and, and a friend and I years ago took a, a Mother's Day class at a, uh, in a different place, not, not through WEF, at a different place. And the teacher was extraordinarily charismatic in a very dictatorial way. First, she had a gorgeous body. Now, there was not an ounce of fat on this woman, and it was all muscle and beautifully sculpted. And she kept on telling us how this is all from yoga. This is from yoga. And then, and that, you know, and, and she had other physical attributes as well. Or, and there must have been, uh, we came in late, so we were, of course, in the first row. And, uh, you know, there were like 20 people behind us who were lapping this up. And she proceeded to do um, a practice. And I have never felt so humiliated. And so she was such a dictator. 
And, and instead of saying, you know, if you try this, if you try this, adjust this and, and uh, it might feel better and don't worry what you look like, think about how you're aligned, you know, the, the typical things. No, 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 it was all about, I think, how you looked. And your feet are too far apart. Move your feet together, it'll be better. And I thought, yeah, when I stop crying inside, you know. And it was, a, but she had a huge following huge following and she's still out there. She's on Long Island. I named no names, but I thought, oh my God. And this is a kind of a thing where um, I thought if you are comfortable with having somebody tell you what to do, and if you do this, life will be good, then this is the kind of teacher for you. But man, it did not encourage thoughtfulness or, or to my mind, any kind of growth. It was like being in fifth grade again with a really nasty teacher. So, but it, but that kind of person can be appealing because they tell you what to do. Yeah. And That's like a red flag to me now is when somebody starts telling me what to do instead of suggest, like offering or allowing, um, instead of, t instead of teaching me how to learn how yeah. to do it my way, then doing it their way. I mean, that's a style, right? It's like a personality thing. Like some, I mean, I think I know what teacher you're talking about, too, so I won't comment on it. It's just not <laughs> that, like, it shouldn't be about just the body, right? That's, like, a yeah. big problem in the West, for sure. But um, there, there are some teachers who are, like, really in traditional lineages who will never harm you, who will do the right thing, who are very strict. And they say, you have to adhere to this. This is the particular lifestyle you have to adhere to. Like, I, I see what your constitution is. I see what this is. And they're, like, very strict about this is what you should do. And this is what you shouldn't do. But that's not necessarily. It depends on the constitution of the person if they can receive things like that. You know, some people like that kind of militant teaching. Um, but I guess I hear your point. Like, your point is that you are, as a teacher, supposed to be guiding people to their own understanding and their own work because they're the only ones who can do the work. You can't do the work for anybody else, right? And I think that's a big part of the sadhana practice is about like, oh, I don't know what this word means. And you can ask somebody what the definition is, but it's their definition. You can take that with a grain of salt, but you can also go look it up in the dictionary and find it in sentence, like depending on how important this word becomes to you. And this is where, uh, how I, for myself, I've been deepening my sadhana practice because, and this could just be because like it's a trust issue now because some boundaries have been broken. And, mm -hmm. but it's also like, that's how I enjoy learning. Like I enjoy like, oh, I need to learn more. What does this word really mean to me? And, and, and journaling about it or, you know, just, or it could be a word that I don't really, I don't really understand, but it's not important to me. So I just like, I'm like, okay, I probably know where it, what it means somewhere and I don't really care enough to dig deeper. But it's not like somebody's, like, it's not like Amanda's like, we're having a spelling test at the end of every, or like a definition test, you know, like she's not demanding which words I learn. She's just allowing us to self-study every morning without her dictating to us, you know? But, but there's also a difference between the guru that you learn from in that capacity and the initiate with yeah and when you initiate with someone it's like you're entering a marriage with them and i personally have never dated with anybody yet because i've never found just the right fit yet i don't really use so, the word guru so i don't mean like guru in the traditional sense i guess that she's oh, you mean like teacher i just mean like teacher like i don't say yeah. i have a guru like i don't i'm not like saying you're not one Amanda, but I just, I guess I never really learned it enough to understand really, but you are my teacher for sure. And, yeah. and you, you've had lots of teachers and you're my teacher too, which is, <laughs> I like learning, you all are, I love, I love learning with you guys, which has been like nice. <laughs> um, I actually found the, the quote, or the, I, I think this is from Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, when they're talking about how to qualify, this is only one portion of like a bigger, there's a whole book on it actually, on like the qualifications to be a guru. This says that you have to be a sober person who can talk.
tolerate the urge to speak, the mind demands, the action to anger, and the urge of the tongue, belly, and genitals. Mm. You're qualified to make disciples all over the world. So if you think about all these people who were like raised up to these positions and then fell, right? Like this, this is like what we're talking about, like these people who were like awful. They took the role of guru and they were like terrible to their students. A lot of them did not control their genitals. Mm. Interesting. Right? Yeah. And it's not like you can't feel anger, but it's like, what are the actions that you take after you feel angry? Um, like some of them would, I mean, you see, like, have you seen that thing from um, Yoga to the People? No. Like all those people who came out, the, the guru there, what he was doing to people, it was like he would act out of anger and like be very vindictive and destroy people's livelihood. And like he would really do terrible, terrible things to people. And like people would trust him because he was, you know, the one in charge. So they thought, oh, well, he's a yogi and he's a teacher, then I can trust him. And that's like a big, a big problem in the West. You know, somebody who can't control their tongue with their students, it's like a big problem if you're going to, like, lash out at your students. You're not qualified to teach them. Yeah. If you can't control the mind's demands, you know, it's supposed to be about a higher purpose, not, like, your egoic needs. So there's, like, a, a whole... You're supposed to act a certain way. If you stop acting that way with your students, you're not qualified to teach them anymore, essentially. Um, I just want to let you know, Ashley joined us this morning. Ashley Cook? No, nope, Ashley Lal. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I dreamed about you. I saw you standing in the middle of the road by Sunrise Highway in the studio last night, Ashley. Oh, my God, that's so weird. <laughs> yeah, you were standing there with, like, you look beautiful. I mean, you look beautiful this morning, too, but I wish I could take a picture of how I saw you. <laughs> that's so funny. I like woke up a little late and I was like, no, it started already. <laughs> but I was like, I can make it still. Yeah, Are you feeling? Growing up, what was your impression of, you know, like what were you taught in the Vaishnava tradition? I can't really hear what. So we are reading this book, Hatha Pradikpaka, and the verse we just read was speaking about a guru and so we were chatting about that and Amanda asks what was your experience in learning about a guru in your tradition growing up so uh my dad initiated with a guru he did do that um but it's interesting because I haven't done that yet at least or I don't know if I ever will but um in our tradition yeah my dad did an initiation ceremony with a guru that he found um it took a lot of years of uh studying under a lot of different people and he actually initiated with a guru um that's originally from trinidad but he has an ashram in india also um so he doesn't actually like physically see him very much which is interesting um so they don't have like regular it's not like he lived with him or like did any of that kind of stuff like he never stayed at the ashram or anything but he studied with him when he was in Trinidad quite a bit. And then he also does like trips to the United States and he did like some study with him here. And so, um, yeah, he doesn't actually like physically have much contact with him, but he does speak to him on the phone. And then like pretty much anytime he's like confused about something or he needs guidance about something, he'll call him and he can like, this man, he's very amazing. He can do like a reading for him, like over the phone of like his energy and tell him, you know, specific things that are going to help him, specific texts to reference. But he'll do that um, really often. Like he won't ever tell him what to do or he won't, you know, um, he won't give him like direct answers to his questions, which is I find is like you know, a common thing that we see with these people is that the, the best teachers, they're not going to sit there and tell you exactly what to do or what the right thing is. But he does direct him to certain like passages to read or certain books to read that he thinks are going to help him figure what he needs to figure out. Hmm. So that's been my experience with it. And uh, it's interesting. I don't know if I ever will find someone that I trust that much, but it is like entering into a marriage. Like when you initiate, when he initiated with his guru, he had like 
a ceremony and he gives him like a um a mantra to say and they do like a chanting ceremony and it's like really nice but it's it is like you're you're bonded bonded to this person for a certain amount of time when you initiate with them is this something he did before you were born or like no more recent it was more recently it was um i would say maybe like five or six years ago yeah so he did it later on in life yeah, that I don't know if I could do that. Like, it's a trust thing. Yeah. You're really bound <laughs> to that person. I won't even marry Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's the work. I mean, they say that the guru, when they initiate with you, are making a promise to reincarnate with you until you're enlightened. Oh, interesting. It's like, here we are for the eternity of your reincarnation. I think <laughs> Kramer is my guru. Out, I will come and I will show up your life and I will help you along your path every single lifetime until you are enlightened because they're already enlightened is the idea supposed to be the idea and they're going to help you get to where they are so really we should all be looking for gurus and not spouses Uh, (laughs) they also say that like (laughs) they also say that you like looking for your guru is not going to help you find them it's kind of this thing that you just know once you meet them. And if you're like always looking for someone to be your teacher, it's like you have this attachment to the yeah. alignment that's not really helping you make a sound decision as to who is going to be best to teach you. And that's how my dad describes it for sure that he has like, he went through so many years of his life, like in his jnana and his study, trying to find his guru and then it wasn't until he, like, he, every time he would, like, get kind of close to someone, he'd be like, no, and he would just be, like, back and forth and kind of all over the place. And uh, he never got the feeling until he was kind of, like, out of practice for a little while um, in terms of, like, his studies. Like, he wasn't reading and stuff for, like, maybe a few years. And then he met this man, and he felt immediately, like, this is my guru. I know it's him. And then um, this man, like, he he doesn't take like a lot of students because he's he he's traveling the world all the time so uh but he also told my dad that he knew that he was his student right away wow i feel like that's like a story of so many like lost like love love story yeah (laughs) exactly when you cut off dating for the rest of your life and then the next week you find your husband you know exactly it's so similar to that it's interesting but it's like that we learn that in the sutras but like we learn that all that like when once you stop having like i know that even from you with poses like once i stop forcing it the next time i i just try it i get it like that with everything yeah it's about the ease it's about the preparation like they say um when you are ready the guru will appear so do the inner work and the preparation to prepare for them to show up <laughs> i think kramer is my guru honestly <laughs> um but it is 808 so we should move to breath and meditation um amanda are you at the studio now i am a few minutes away running late <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll set the phones and you guys can meditate i'll talk to you all soon <laughs> thank you for calling you're welcome um all right bye bye amanda had to go to the studio to meet um construction workers uh for the wall well they're redoing the hvac system in the building yeah they're upgrading it from the fire so it's good because then the building is handling it but i think she has to be there i think that's why maybe it's different construction workers i don't know um, well, but, we're upgrading the HVAC system because that will also help during COVID. That makes a huge difference to have uh, a, a decent. Yeah, no, it's both. Like she, it's it's intertwined. It's but great. I think because of the fire, it's helping. It's not relying just on Amanda and Rev to do it. You know, it's a building effort. Yep. Yeah, which it, helps financially. So is today the first day back on Sadhana? No, we went back. I think. Um, September 1st. Uh, um, so I posted, do you have the link to the book? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I saw it yesterday because of your post, so that's why I'm back today. <laughs> um, so I forget, let me see, where did we just leave off? We Four finished 14. Okay, so tomorrow we'll start 15. Yeah, tomorrow's 15. If, I don't know if you've read this book or are familiar with it, Ashley. I was scared of it because I'm like, what are these words? But I absolutely, we all are loving it so far. Yeah. It is yeah. such a direct, clear explanation, and it starts, I, 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 since I'm relatively, I'm not new to the practice, but I'm new to this aspect of the practice, this is so great for me. There's basic definitions, and, and it also kind of resonates with some of the stuff that came up when we were reading the sutras. So, so I'm in love, yeah. And I, I, I do like that she'll be like, this is how we should be doing it, but... Yeah, like in the sutras, it doesn't have the spin on it where it's like we live in this world now. Like you can't do it. You can't dedicate your whole life to it, but do it do it this way instead. Yeah, exactly. Things have changed. So, all right, adapt, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love this book. It's really good. I think you guys are going to love it. Oh, awesome. Well, well good. <laughs> um, how are you feeling, Ashley? I feel great. I'm out of the first trimester now, and I feel like a brand new person. <laughs> Thank you. In my dream, I saw you when you were standing in the road, and I said hi to you, and you didn't hear me. And Eric's like, she didn't hear me. <laughs> like, hi, Ashley. <laughs> standing in this beautiful outfit, but you had, like, your, like, belly out. I don't know. It kind of reminded me of, like, an Alicia Keys look, I could imagine. Like, the headband, and you just, like, very, very cute. That's awesome. And then here we are, because I, I didn't realize we started again. So, uh, I'm gonna post it in that group, but like I make a note and then I forget. And yeah, I'm so, here now, so here you are. Yeah, I saw your post yesterday, so I was like, all right, I'm gonna get up tomorrow. And I was a little late, but made it. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, Micheline's out camping, so she should be back on tomorrow and she'll read. Okay, cool. If you want to join, yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's set up. We'll do some alternate nostril breathing and then I'll set the timer. 20 minutes. Where's my. Finding a comfortable seat, straight spine, relax the shoulders, take a few breaths in through the nose and out through the nose. Just begin to notice how you're breathing. See if you can slow the breath down, lengthen it, fill up the low belly as you inhale. And then exhale, bring the belly button to the spine, let all the air out. For me, this practice of just checking in how I'm breathing throughout my day and taking three reset breaths is a really helpful tool. Just to acknowledge what's going on. Let the emotions wash over me. The good ones, the bad ones. Helps me attach to the present moment instead of getting lost in the past or present or future. And then we'll move into our alternate nostril breathing, closing right nostril with right thumb, inhale left, close left with right right finger, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Inhale left. Close left, exhale right. 
Inhale, right. Close, right. Exhale, left. Inhale, left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. If you want to keep going and taking a few more rounds, go ahead. I'm going to set the timer for 20 minutes.
bringing hands together in front of your heart. Namaste.